so let's get this thing started. Right? Um, part treat. Uh, 21 years ago, Vanity Fair's editor-in-chief, Graydon Carter, called me into his office and asked me if I'd ever been to Seattle. Nope, I hadn't. Would you like a trip out there paid for by Condé Nast? He wanted to know. Sure, I shrugged, knowing this was his way of leading up to yet another assignment. Graydon could never just say, go interview, fill in the name of the famous person. Uh, there was always an editorial wind-up, a tease, a test of my testosterone levels. Hollywood was my usual beat. I had a hell of a lot of airline miles amassed for a uh, free trip someplace else one day if I could ever find the time between assignments back then to take one. Who the fuck's in Seattle, I asked, upping my levels a bit, which I kind of always hated myself for doing in his presence. Graydon grin. Courtney Love, he said. And keep that tone when you meet her. Say fuck a lot and act like that's what you want to do to her. Yeah. Now, other than my being gay, Graydon thought we were the perfect match. And he was right, as he still today a brilliant editor usually was. It remains one of the best cover stories I ever wrote about anyone during my 14 years at Vanity Fair. I cherish that story, although I'm not sure I exactly cherish all the time I spent with her back then, when you get to spend a lot of time with the subject, and not like today when you're lucky to get an hour with a celebrity between a bowel movement and a Botox injection. <laughs> But I do cherish the friendship that has sprung up with Courtney since all that time we spent together back in 1995. It was a different time in her life. It was a different time in mine. We'll talk a bit about that a bit later. Um, if you're here tonight, you already know about her career with Hole and its platinum albums, Live Through This and Celebrity Skin, and her Golden Globe nom nomination for her role in Milos Forman's The People vs. Larry Flint, and her roles in Sons of Anarchy and Empire, etc., etc., etc. She even cut a track on Empire's soundtrack album, which debuted at number one on Billboard's Top 200 list, and of which England's The Guardian wrote, The idea of Courtney Love singing a ballad with a group of gospel singers seems fair, faintly terrifying. <laughs> the reality is brilliant. Love's voice fits the careworn lyrics, effortlessly summoning the kind of ravaged darkness that Lana Del Rey nearly ruptures herself trying to conjure up. <laughs> Perhaps taking her cue from that rave, last spring Courtney joined Lana Del Rey on her endless summer tour with an eight-show performance arc. Now look, I can list all her credits, but this night isn't sold out for nothing. You know all that. You might also, however, have your own ideas about Courtney and maybe some preconceived notions about her and even psychological projections regarding how she fits into your lives, which tonight we just might disrupt. But I readily acknowledge that is how iconic figures serve us in their cultural presence in our lives, as vessels for our fantasies. And Courtney has been such a presence for a long time now. The genius rock chick come wanton widow who never wanted our approval, or, or did she, yet always wanted our, well, she wanted our love. There was something ravenous in her need. It didn't matter for what, finally, for we knew that same indefinable ravenousness. It too raged in us, but we kept it successfully at bay. Courtney, God bless her, raged for us. She has never been slick, but she does have these days a kind of hard-earned grace. At 51 years old, she's a little bit merry and faithful now, and a whole lot of linya. And yet she's wholly original. She's all Courtney Love. This newest phase of her career has been in the theater by way of a pop opera, a kind of stage concept album called Kansas City Choir Boy, which was written by Todd Allman, in which he co-starred with Courtney in New York, in LA, and at Harvard's ART uh, in Cambridge, and which Rolling Stone described as slyly punk rock although I'd call it punkishly sly rock. Uh, the New York Times theater critic, Charles Isherwood, wrote of her in his rave review of the show, Ms. Love, whose resume as a rock performer, occasional actress, and frequent tabloid fixture I probably don't need to rehash, has a surprisingly soft-edged, bewitching presence. Her eyes have a transfixing quality, and she moves with a slinky sexual tread. 
Her voice retains the singular sound that made her an electrifying front woman for the band whole. A single sustained note can seem simultaneously to contain a plea, a wound, and a threat. Courtney met her match in Todd Allman, who is not only a brilliant composer, the New Yorker has compared his work to Hoagy Carmichael's and its shared, bemused, fragmented stylings. But he's also a remarkable actor and singer and a performer in his own right, as you're about to see. Uh, Kansas City Choir Boy is but one of 10 shows he's written, among the uh, musicals based on The Odyssey, The Tempest, and The Winter's Tale, which were all done at New York's public th theater. As an actor, he's appeared in productions of I Am My Own Wife and Hedwig and the Angry Inch. He's also done the requisite New York actor's role on Law and Order SVU. She, however, has done him one better by having an episode of that show based on her fucking life. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, here's Mr. Todd Allman and Ms. Courtney Love. Welcome to San Francisco. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. <laughs> so in a way, it's welcome home, right? I mean, you yeah, have I was a history here. here. You have a history here. Yes, I have a, a lengthy history here. Well, 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 tell us a brief bit of it. <laughs> well, I was born here. Yes. And, um, and then uh, we moved to Oregon, and then we moved back here. Mm -hmm. I moved back here as a punky uh, 14, 15 year old, mm -hmm. and lived in these places called the Beer Vats, mm -hmm. um, and did a lot of drugs. <laughs> and, um, what? Did a lot of drugs here, okay, okay. and uh, started a lot of imaginary bands, and uh, 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 with girlfriends, and right. and a semi real band. Oh, and I was in, I was in Faith No More here, my first band that was had substance. It was a real band. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know about now, but back then in the 80s, San Francisco was not happening for a scene mm -hmm. to, for bands. Right. It wasn't a good place to get signed from, and uh, industry's changed so much. But um, I know every inch of it. I can walk in the whole city. Right. I just know. Is it right. good memories, bad bad memories? Or what is it? A little of both. I, I had very wealthy grandparents. Mm -hmm. um, Were they really Bosch and Loam? People have read no, it. that's a, that's a that's, nonsense that's myth. I started for myself. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna clear up a lot of shit tonight, okay? <laughs> I wanted people to think I was a big heiress <laughs> down here in Punkyville, so I started that nonsense. Okay. No, they were they were called the Reeses. Okay. And they lived at 999 Green, mm -hmm. um, out my window at the Fairmont. You, you can see their building. And my mother was adopted by them. And they were um, very wealthy. And it was the 60s. I was born in 64. So they were like, we had a maiden named Model. Right. And my, my grandmother, Reese, was very glamorous. Mm -hmm. She would take me to Gump's. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and Jack Reese was... Um, he did something. He had a he had a shop in the in the way I got the Bosch and Lam thing is that he made his money off optician stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I just took that and made it bigger. Right. And um, it's called acting. It's called acting. <laughs> and uh, I, he was a nice grandpa, and mm -hmm. and they, they weren't my real grandparents, mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't know that for a long time. Mm -hmm. And. Um, they were just really rich, and it was great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've always liked your money. I've always liked my money, honey. <laughs> That's true. And and he left me a small trust fund. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, five hundred dollars a month. And my probate officer was on the financial district <laughs> at trust Wells fund Fargo. The probate officer. Okay. And I would tell him outrageous lies okay. because I was on such a little tiny stipend a month. Mm -hmm. So I would tell him, you know, I felt I needed before he ever saw me. I told him I needed a modeling portfolio. <laughs> For ten thousand dollars, and I was in New York. I told him I fell through a taxi windshield, and I, I would just make outrageous lies. So that trust fund lasted from sixteen to twenty-two, and then it was gone. Okay. And where did you grow up, Todd? 
I <laughs> much different. A little different. <laughs> I was Did like, you need a modeling <clears throat> portfolio. No, I was I was like a, a goody two shoes in a small town in Nebraska. My dad worked on the railroad, and my mother was the high school secretary, and my brothers were like these you know jockey popular guys who mm -hmm. hated cheerleaders and yeah. And what were you? I was you know wanting to be in musicals. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you look like hey, a football so there was, player. There were no bands at all in, in Alliance, Nebraska. Um, uh, uh, what did you just ask me? I said, you look like a football player, but I you know, wanted to be a They shooter. were all very disappointed right. because I looked like, you know, like my brothers were basketball players mm -hmm. and sort of popular, which actually worked in my uh, favor because I had this little invisible shield of protection around me because I was like, you know, like the town fag, a little bit. You know, it's like this wispy kid who like right. cried in corners and wrote songs and that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> but my brothers were popular, so it gave me this little buffer of protection. Um, uh, but no, I, they they were athletes, and everyone thought, oh, here comes Todd, and he's much taller than they are, and this is going to be great. And then they quickly. Uh, so you both sort of wanted to escape yeah. your upbringings. Yeah. Yes. Right? So do you have that in common when you, how, how did you first meet to do Kansas City Choir Boy? How, well, how did that happen? Um, I was exploring uh, Nirvana and putting uh, Nirvana to a non-jazz hands cool musical. And okay. that's very, very <laughs> that's <the title>. hard. <laughs> and I um, was thinking about um, this one A-list screenwriter and his very A-list producer, and um, I was being really delusional. And I met this, his husband, who's an agent, a theater agent. Mark Subius. Mark, Mark Subius. Mm -hmm. And he met me at my club in London. Um, I have one club I'm in, which is <laughs> nice. It's called the Grab Show Club. Mm -hmm. And he, um, he patted me on my hand, and he was like, he, he talked me off the ledge, basically. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody can make it that into a musical, it's it's Mark Subius. But um, through Mark, I met Todd, and we just re got on like a house on fire. And, and you'd already written it. Yes. And were you looking for someone to be in it with with you at that point? Yeah, or? we. Um, my friend Kevin and I were developing it for this um, opera festival mm -hmm. in New York called the Prototype Festival, and it just all it all kind of happened at the same time that Kevin and I had been wanting to do this for years, and Prototype said let's do it this coming winter and and Courtney and I had been friends at that point for a while and it just all Kevin and I were sitting around dreaming thinking well who's the perfect human being and when we talk more about the piece you'll understand why mm -hmm. um and then yeah I we I, I thought of Courtney and it seemed like such a, a huge dream to mm -hmm. to have her do it and um I don't know she said yes <laughs> and, and was it an instant yes or were you a little fearful or no it's it was not, an instant yes it was because um in Portland, I had done some children's theater, mm -hmm. but I'd never done theater theater. I know nothing I about theater. I think those children are still talking to those shrinks about <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Um, and I'd always, yeah, I'd done like Portland Civic Theater, and uh, I really wanted to do theater, but I didn't know how. Mm -hmm. So it struck me that to start with somebody like Todd Almond and Kevin Newberry, who are experienced. I mean, t Todd's done music to, to Winter's Tale, right. to Tempest, mm -hmm. to Shakespeare plays I, I don't know the plot, the plot of. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I felt like the intellectual um, air was very rarefied mm -hmm. and that I would get trained well mm -hmm. and that is what taken care of and taken, trusted I, and trust was important though. trust and I trusted Todd and Kevin and, and Mark very much and Todd and me developed a very good chemistry and what's it about Todd T tell us what what was the impulse and well Kansas City Choir Boy is it started off as just a bunch of songs. I, I, I mean, I, there's a long version of the story and the short version. I'll give you the, the, okay. short, the short version. Um, in about 2004, I was hired by the Juilliard School to write a musical adaptation of the Odyssey for their third year class. And um, I did that. It was a, a beautiful production and uh, had some great actors. And Oscar Isaac was in it, which I always oh, wow. think was yeah. Oh, it was it I was yeah. He's wonderful. And uh, and this beautiful young actress named Sarah Fox mm -hmm. played the goddess Athena. And um, we did the show, 
you know, life went on. And later that year, I got a phone call from one of my company members saying, uh, have you seen Sarah Fox? And I said, I don't, I haven't, I don't really know Sarah Fox other than the fact that we'd made the show together. And uh, it turns out she was missing. And um, I don't want to make it too maudlin, uh, but a few days later I was home working and like I had the news on and all of a sudden her face popped up and it said body of missing Juilliard student found and she had been murdered uh, and they still don't know to this day who did it. And um, it was the only time ever in my life that that, you know, those, those faces pop up all the time and they're so anonymous and it was the only time I knew the actually knew the person and I can't even tell you what that felt like to just see and I didn't even know her all that well we had done this show but just to see a face I I recognized and um, a couple of years later I was in Kansas City at kind of a low point in my life and feeling <clears throat> really blue working on a project I wasn't all that particularly interested in but I was kind of doing it to stay alive and um, I was at my hotel and the news was on and a face popped up of a missing girl and it just triggered that memory of Sarah and I was in Kansas City and I'm from Nebraska so I have all of this baggage about the Midwest and what it means to kind of run away from the Midwest and Sarah had played Athena in the Odyssey so all of that imagery came back to me and the idea of these sirens kind of calling someone to their destruction so I just started writing I didn't know I was writing a show I just was responding to this um, inspiration and I wrote a bunch of songs and then it slowly turned into this story that is really has nothing to do with that in a weird way that was the the, the starting point but it's about somebody in the Midwest and Courtney plays the part of Athena um, finding love in the Midwest but having a stronger impulse to be to follow these sirens and to not know what they're leading her to so that's basically where it came from and what it's did about. you did you ever consider it being a boy was it always a woman it was always it was always a woman it, I mean I feel like Athena is is absolutely feminine energy right, so right, right. yeah okay and <clears throat> what was it about Courtney that made you think she could who uh, I mean who is the goddess Athena besides <laughs> Courtney love <laughs> Jesus. I mean, look, you have to look at the character and without, without the character doing one thing, you have, to th you have to think to make the show work. Oh, you have, you exist outside the realm of the rest of us. Right. Like you have an extra layer of fate on you right. that we mere mortals just do not have. Mm -hmm. You should go wherever the horizon is. You shouldn't stay in Kansas City. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's not really a book <clears throat> musical. No. It's, it's sort of sung, th it's sung through. Right. 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 Yeah. And it's... It's you longing for this woman who's left you? Well, the, keeps surfacing or? The way the show starts is I play this musician and I'm sitting on my laptop writing <clears throat> garage band tracks. And uh, we play with fun playing with like the familiar garage band loops. And the TV's on and you see Courtney's face pop up. Mm -hmm. And it says, you know, like local woman found dead. Right. And then it, you don't really know this. It, it's very just, it's suggested, but it kind of then leaps back in time right. and tells our whole relationship. Okay. And we're a couple. <clears throat> You're a couple, yeah. right? We're a couple and we get married and mm -hmm. break up and then I run off to, my character runs yeah. off to New York. These but sirens are constantly there's a, there's a beautiful song in it that I saw in a New York Times video called All I Ever Wanted. Yes. It has two beautiful lyrics in it that I really love. One is about the ghost that jumps from person to person mm -hmm. and always finds me or something mm -hmm. like that. I'm, I am, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it. Mm -hmm. And the other one is about, um, I'm, I'm reading a book and I get to a line that makes me laugh because I know how much you, you would hate it. <laughs> I love that line so much. I mean, thank you. Who of, I mean, I've, I've had that kind of relationship where yeah. a sentence can yeah. remind, remind me. Right. Of someone, but that that other line about the ghost jumping from person to person always finds me—it's very haunting, of you, of your story, of right. of you know the narrative of your life that that we all know. When when you read that lyric, did you think of your own life, or were you so into Athena that it was just her? No, I didn't think of my own life. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's been—I mean, it's <clears throat> really been a trip doing this. Mm -hmm. It's been great. That was the song I played for you first. That was the very that was first, the first song. One? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> one thing we did do is um, 
You should know, I, I'm on my 67th day of not smoking. <laughs> I would like some applause for her. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But um, I was really smoking a lot. I've always been a big smoker until 67 days passed. And... Um, but that's one of the reasons you took the job. I took the job because Mark and Todd would let me smoke in their apartment. <laughs> but they, they have a dog named Dingo, and they didn't know how much I smoked. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's neighbors. It's a, it's a you know, really nice New York apartment. And um, I was smoking, I don't know, two packs or something. It was it, fine. He was, he's fine with it. Yeah, it I can't believe me. how fine you are with it. I mean, I mean, I'm now a viable house guest and stuff. You know? <laughs> And, and the Fairmont's not giving me warnings about my $1,000 fees and stuff. From, so, But also, it wasn't like my eighth grade math teacher was smoking in my apartment. It was Courtney Love smoking in my apartment. So I was like, fine, go ahead. I don't care. We got to jump, but we got to jump on the, the, the material mm -hmm. early um, because the prototype festival was only going to give us 10 days to rehearse. Mm -hmm. And I've never done this before. Right. So I put my own self out into New York put myself up and went up to Todd's apartment every single night, smoked a ton and mm -hmm. memorized the stuff that I needed to memorize. And then when we got with the girls, the sirens mm -hmm. and the director and all this stuff. And I really was like, Todd, what's the point of a direct, a theater director? I didn't, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, no. it's, it's amazing to me. You come from this world of rock, which is not about discipline on no, stage. It's not about really. the opposite of discipline. Uh, absolutely. So you go into the theater world, which is all about discipline. Yes. But yet you have to find, I mean, the art of theater is finding the freedom within the discipline. I mean, yes. it find, in the, within the parameters, you know, you find this amazing freedom and liberty. Within yes. The discipline. So did you find a new definition of freedom doing theater? And well, Todd, I had like Todd teach you. Todd, and, Todd and Mark way? taught me a lot. Um, there's a, a, a play called Marjorie Prime mm -hmm. that one of Mark's clients wrote starring the great, great Lois Smith. Mm -hmm. And he took me to the taper in LA to see it. And she does, she plays a robot. She doesn't move. I'm used to doing this, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and whatever the hell I want and diving into you and pretend and acknowledging you. Mm -hmm. And in this, there's absolutely, you guys don't exist. Except for the, that one song that one we have song talked that we're about. Gonna do tonight. That we're about to do right now. Why don't we just oh. go ahead and do it? Oh, okay. And let's show them what we're talking about. Well, but, but to set it up, oh, okay. they taught me, these guys, Todd and Kevin, and, and, and Mark wasn't there all the time, but Todd and, right. and Todd and Kevin taught me, you know, the audience doesn't exist. Right. And I was taking a lot of acting classes and learning that stuff. So the song we're about to do for you, um, I look, I, oh, I drop the fourth wall and I go and I look at everybody. It's really a mind, a mind fuck because we're playing in this very small venue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. We would be right. I mean, as close to the audience for that show as we are to you now, even closer. Right. And just, just the two of us, I locked the entire time. And then this song, she this breaks it. Right. But you did tell me that one of your great talents is to be able to skull fuck people. Skull I, I never, I never even heard that term. <laughs> That's an old term, I guess. Right. So you're about to get skull fucked. <laughs> was coming, a phone call from you. Then I caught sight of my TV 
I'd left on all night. I hate that. Waking up to some stupid show. Now all I ever wanted in this lifetime was to see a movie with you. I believe you are a ghost and you jump from person to person and find me each time and just when I let myself relax you leap and I look for you again and all I ever wanted in this lifetime was to see a movie with you No matter how hard I try I can't make it so fucking care I read a book and I laugh at a sentence that I know you would hate. I see your lips curl, your eyes close, your hands grip, and your t shirt. Doesn't that make you want to see the whole thing? Whoa. Oh my God, yeah. It's remarkable. So what, how different was it to do it in Cambridge, New York, and LA? Were the audiences very different? Mm -hmm. Did, it, they did were. it change I the mean, performance? I think that, that is exactly why I prefer theater as an art form, because mm -hmm. it is all of us in the room right now making the thing together. I mean, as much as maybe you feel like you're coming to watch something, it really is we're all making it together we've worked very hard to make it but it doesn't it's not something that then you take home and watch on your own it's like we all all of our energy together mm -hmm. so the new york audiences didn't know what they were coming into it was a tiny 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 we had 80 seats 80, wow. 80 yeah. seats total yeah. i mean it was less than this oh my gosh it was this tiny tiny little room and um it just felt like we were bursting out of that room and then cambridge we did it in a an old bar that was mm -hmm. converted to a theater so we just in the spirit of, well, let's make it for this space and for the audience that's coming, we completely restaged it. We used the bar, the girls, the sirens were dancing on the bars. We were running around on this upper level, which we didn't have in the other, uh, in the New York space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then LA was just, it was a theater more like this. And we had to, we put the, yeah, we put most of the audience on stage and then we, you know, blocked off some of the house because we didn't want it to get so massive because part of the fun was being, you know, 10 feet away. And what is, <clears throat> do you get, when you're in a play, when you're in a musical, a pop opera, a concept a album, whatever this is, um, do you get some of your fans coming to the theater that don't exactly know theater? Theater? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Some. And what's that like? Um, well, I hope they get a good education. Right. Mm -hmm. And right. they get that song, so right. they get some interaction. Mm -hmm. um, but they aren't getting, you know, wah! Right, They're not right, getting that right, yeah, thing. Right. And, um, I mean, are, are you it, It's not a lot of whole fans, it's right. some. Right, I mean, are you cognizant of taking your fans along with you on your career? Like, okay, I'm 
doing some theater here now. Uh, let's come along with me, grow along with me, grow up with me. Right. Our, our... Not until you just said it, but... Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what I'm here for. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> I think we had amazing, amazing audiences show up, and I think everyone with an idea of what they were going to get, and Courtney was like, this is... She nailed it so beautifully and consistently worked right. so incredibly hard to to make something that was a gift to her fans that came and it was just it was something new like you can go hear someone perform and know what you're getting and and, ex and know what you're expecting but this was like mm. a, a new i don't know i, I mm. thought it was so beautiful to watch every night mm -hmm. and what was it like for you you're so used to performing either on a sound stage or for the, the madness chaos the chaos of a rock thing to come into a theater environment is very different yeah so how did you react to it i just look at it as a really important learning experience i want to do more theater mm -hmm. and um i really like it as i'm, I'm 51 right. so i don't you know lana asked me to do the whole tour with her i didn't want to do it 121 days right. no Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right, right. Mm -hmm. You've done that. <laughs> Honey. And now. So, uh, you, you now shop at Torso. In San yes, Francisco. I did. I shopped at Torso in San Francisco. Uh, yes, lovely. yes, right. Let's give Torso yeah. a shout out. Um, let's give them a shout out. And um, yeah, and I've been watching a lot of noir movies, and right. I wanted to give a shout out to Betty and Stanwyck. And I mean, we went out to eat last night, and you went out to the Castro with a friend, and mm -hmm. You refused to go out. You were like, no, I'm going back to my hotel. No, I don't. Yeah, I don't go out. So you, I mean, exactly. So you're more of a re recluse. You're a recluse. A little bit, yeah. yeah. A little bit. Now, do you, do you remember this? Our vanity character? <laughs> yes. Yeah. You're, now, when you, look, when you look at this person, right? Yeah. When you, 21 years ago, he was in high school when this came Was out. he? Yes, he was in Nebraska <laughs> crying in a corner writing songs. <laughs> oh, my God. Who told you that? <laughs> So when you look at this person now, what do you, who do you see? Well, I read, I reread it recently. It's a good article. It's very good. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's I'll very it. sexual. It's very sexual. It's very, you, you're a very gifted writer. I mean, and she took a bath in front of you. I took a bath in front of you. And yeah. I, wasn't there a New Orleans bit yeah, too we went to where New I Orleans, had a fantasy we, of moving to New Orleans? Yeah, we went to New Orleans. And I, um, I went on tour with Hole. We were in, right. You haven't lived till you've seen Hole in Salt Lake City. <laughs> <laughs> In the nineties. Yeah, in the nineties. Yeah. Um, I I I look at that. I don't know. What's the question? I mean, I mean, do you recognize that person? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think you're a very different person now than you were then. Yeah, I am. I mean, I'm much more mellow. I don't do drugs right. anymore, and I I and I'm trying to quit smoking, and um, I'm you know I'm I'm right. really pretty content. I mean, I mean there there was another picture I, I was I was showing Mark of uh, the the Herberts photos that are amazing. Right. And then there's the okay. Vanity Fair Oscar party, and there's a little snapshot of you and Amanda when you were my dates at the oh Oscar my God. party. I remember and that. recently, I'm going to drop another name here because I'm a name dropper. Uh, I was in New Orleans on my book tour, and I ran into Jessica Lang, and we went out on the balcony to smoke, in fact. Right, I, right. I don't smoke, but she smokes like you used to smoke. Right. And, um, and we were talking about you, and that night of that party, because it's in the book, you're you're both in in my new book, and she, right. she remembers you. We left the Vanity Fair party and went to uh, what was the restaurant that was closing? Um, Chasen's. Chasen's. We right. went to Chasen's for the for this other party, and you came and knelt at her feet. I was in the booth with her, and you had the tiara on, right? And the little slip, and she said, and I looked into her face, and I thought, oh my God. I am looking at Blanche Dubois. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> you freaked her out. I'm so excited to so, hear that I freaked Jessica so, Lang out. I mean, <laughs> wow! <laughs> So, um, play, a person the, who played Blanche Dubois. I, well, yeah, but see, my, but my whole point is, I think you'd be a great Blanche Dubois. I think I would too. I couldn't yeah, agree with you more. Great Blanche Dubois. Thank and you. I think, and I think your good friend Lily Taylor would be great as your sister. Stella. Yeah, Stella. Lily Taylor is Stella. But he, who could play Stanley? 
Mark. I mean, not Mark. Not, no, Todd. Todd, no, no. But I think a black person should should play Stan. I think it would be interesting for a black guy to play Stan. I think there has been an African American production of Streetcar. In fact, I know there has. But I mean, a white Blanche and a black. Oh, white Blanche. Would be, yeah, would be really interesting. It's, I think you'd be great, Blanche. I think you'd be a great, Martha. And. And uh, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? Oh, that, I, that, I mean, that's... I'm determined to get you a theater career in your 50s. That's, that's you know. I, Thank you, Kevin. I'm determined to get you. Yeah. Right? I was asked to do Stella when I was in my 30s um, on the West End. I didn't really? like the stand. Oh, I was asked to do everything, With... and I turned it all down. Um, Who was Blanche? I, I, uh, I forget. It wasn't Jessica. Um it was, I didn't like the Stanley. Oh, okay. I was very, I was a bit of a jackass in my okay. 30s. <laughs> I, sh I should have done it because I knew that in my future I would do a Blanche at some point in my life. Mm -hmm. And um, that sounds really like a lot of hubris, but I'm not going to be, I have a lot of hubris. So. <laughs> Fuck it. Um, but uh, I thought, wow, I would be like a Stella and a Blanche, you know, because I wanted to get into this theater phase. But I have yet to, we've only done this one thing. Mm -hmm. So I want to see what, I want to explore it you, further. You guys do have a very visceral, kinetic, mm -hmm. sexual energy in this piece. It is very sort of Stanley and, Bl and, and Blanche in a, in a strange way. That's why, no, that's why I, I, I said it. I wasn't being facetious. I mean, mm -hmm. you, I've seen the number you're about to do mm -hmm. in a few minutes, mm -hmm. and that's really... Blanche and Stanley. Mm -hmm. it, it also, can I, can we tell the chain story? Yeah. Okay, so, you know, I come from um, rock, mm -hmm. and Todd comes from a, a erudite, more intellectual. He doesn't watch the Kardashians, I do. Um, she, watched the, <laughs> she watched them today. I watch reruns. That's really bad. She might not That's smoke, but so she so depressing. I watch reruns when Kendall and Kylie were little and Bruce was there and stuff. And, um, and I'm, I'm friendly with them and stuff. Yeah, I live in L.A. You have to, you know, they're not going anywhere. So <laughs> I, I, I like I thought them. this was going to be an interview. This is going to be an intervention. <laughs> no, they're nice. They're nice to me. They're really nice to me. And, and I have no problem with them. But, um, um, but watching them in the middle of the day reruns in San Francisco is a little bit sad yeah <laughs> okay but um anyway todd we todd, had a torso we'd had lunch we'd gone to barney's <laughs> we'd gone to barney's we'd had lunch i was like put it on the e channel and getting a massage and um you're 51 and i'm 51 and i'm not smoking <laughs> and so i'm watching my kardashian and what were we talking about uh, oh right <laughs> i come from rock and and todd doesn't come from, he doesn't come from as much stones rock as I do so we were sitting one night I mean, this is an opera prototype is an opera festival for you know proper Renee Fleming Placido Domingo Renee Fleming was in the front row one night of our show it, Such a, I yeah. swear yeah Renee Fleming opera was sitting in the front came. row yeah. like was, and then like and then like two seats behind her was David Byrne like we had the wow. great it was 80 seats in New York wow. so like you know they and it was a hot yeah. Yeah. so um, <laughs> so I said to him listen well, you want opera I'll tell you about opera when Fleetwood Mac were the biggest band in the world and doing more cocaine than any band ever, there was a, a 1982 tour called the Mirage Tour. And there's a great Fleetwood Mac song called The Chain. And it's Stevie Nicks on stage with Lindsey Buckingham, and they fucking hate each other. And it, they're the biggest band in the world, and you can practically see the cocaine on their face. <laughs> I mean, it's, and it's so operatic. So we went on this YouTube, and we watched this 1982 clip from YouTube of The Chain, and it really affected him. And he picks up a guitar, and we, we kind of based... It is operatic. She looks like she's in full kabuki mode, and he's fucking hating yeah. on her. And yeah. it's... Very yeah. real. So we took the chain and kind of <laughs> built that a little into yes. the fireworks. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the show had like a rebirth when Courtney came in. I had written it, but then it just like reacted to this incredible, you know, was, chemistry. I, yeah, I read where you said that mm -hmm. she brought her, 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 an artistic ammunition mm -hmm. to the show, which is very aggressive and yeah. violent and. Uh, it's a it's an interesting word choice ammunition it felt like it i mean like this song in particular was was sort of 
was 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 like thoughtful and lovely and slow and yes, and we yeah. watched that video and then in, in like over the course of that day we just sat in my apartment and just rethought the entire thing and I don't and know. then and it did feel like ammunition to, it like murdered that song we was, murdered it and yeah. then when we got to, yeah. to uh, we didn't have the space in New York but when we got to uh, the American Repertory Theater in Boston we started moving around mm -hmm. and then when we got to the Kirk Douglas in Los Angeles we really started moving around so it was like a war so we've just been married mm -hmm. um, and we've just had this celebratory marriage song mm -hmm. hey let's get married I mean that's not the song but it's, <laughs> <laughs> I wrote that I wrote that I wrote that <laughs> I, I, I love the modern world the guy is the one who's married to a man and she's the single person <laughs> right I'm not single well, well, we'll get into that in a minute. No, I we saw, won't. I saw on, I saw, <laughs> I saw on Facebook that you put you in a domestic oh partner. Oh God, you know, people are so nosy. I deleted that in three. Oh, you did? Okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Edited out of the video. Nothing not is that deleted. I'm nosy. It Nothing. came up on my yeah. Facebook page. <laughs> and I went and sought it out. <laughs> we were just talking about that earlier. <laughs> Someone Sorry. took a someone took a picture and sent it to my Sorry. boyfriend, and he sent it to me. It was up for three minutes. <laughs> swear to God. Um, anyway, she has a much younger boyfriend. He's very cute. I met him during Oscar weekend. He's very cute. Yeah, yeah. Good for you. Own it. You don't have to name him. No, but, I'm certainly not going. But, but <laughs> you, you can say his age though. No. No. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Anyway, I'm happy for you. Thank let's you. Put it that way. But let's get back to fireworks. Yeah. <laughs> so we've just been married, and uh, and then we break up, and, and and because it's not because it's a little more surreal than a than a book show, mm -hmm. you know, than The Lion King or right. something. Um, we get married and then instantly break up in this next song that we're going to perform. You want to do it now? Or yeah. Do you, you want to? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Just just um, to follow that up a little, like the construction of the show is mo is important moments in their relationship right. with zero connective tissue. Mm -hmm. So we see them get married in this big, she's wearing this long pink veil, and I'm in this blue shirt, and we mm -hmm. have spin and dance, and all the girls are mm -hmm. singing, and then the next thing that happens is we split up. And you never know in this script, which I was by design, how much time has passed, mm -hmm. how their marriage was, mm -hmm. why they're breaking up, you know. You, you suspect it's because she's looking at these sirens mm -hmm. on the horizon, and that's actually what's, who are pulling what she wants this to do big city and, yeah, yeah. and, and a destiny <clears throat> greater than yeah. being with him in Kansas yeah. City writing well yeah, yeah. he's writing songs yeah next up fireworks here we go <laughs> <laughs>
enemy Lying on a bed Hand on your heart Singing And this is killing me And you look like That's amazing. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I love that. I love that stomping. Thank you. I love that stomping. Stomping. So we just did that in my, in my apartment one day. I mean, it was a mm -hmm. totally different song until Courtney came along. You murdered it. Huh? Yeah. It's Murder like, it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's just, just she's so alive and electric. It's just. Oh, he's so alive and electric.